The story begins by showing the starry night sky where a young lad named Shiki found himself gazing at a shooting star, accompanied by two quirky humanoid robots. One was none other than his grandpa, the Demon King, while the other was his buddy, Michael. Grandpa Ziggy, being the Demon King and all, insisted that the star was actually a dragon, while Michael argued that it was just a comet. Amidst their playful banter, Grandpa Ziggy revealed to Shiki a profound truth. Someday, he would have to venture beyond their humble abode, explore new lands, and make countless friends. These friends, Grandpa Ziggy assured, would be Shiki's biggest supporters. And if they shed a tear for him, Shiki must treasure their friendship for eternity. Now, Shiki had this funny idea that Michael couldn't shed tears because, well, robots don't have hearts. But Grandpa Ziggy was quick to correct him, stating that everyone, no matter who they are, possesses a heart. Curiosity peaked. Shiki inquired about the mysteries of outer space. And much to his surprise, Grandpa Ziggy revealed that space held more than just stars and planets. It was teeming with insects, too. Somewhere out there, he added, existed a celestial being capable of granting wishes, a mother figure of sorts. At that moment, Michael turned to Shiki and asked him what he desired most. That skipping a beat, Shiki replied with a gleeful grin, I want to make a whole bunch of friends. Years rolled by and Destiny brought a spirited girl named Rebecca and her trusty feline companion Happy to the splendid Grand Bell Kingdom. Their mission? To capture the kingdom's enchanting sights on video. As they arrived, the robotic Manx greeted them, thrilled to have their first guests in a hopping century. But there was yet another peculiar machine eagerly awaiting their arrival within the kingdom's walls. This time, it was a robot servant who suggested they embark on a daring mission. Little did they know that their adventure would lead them face to face with a colossal robotic cat. And in a stunning turn of events, who should appear atop this mechanical marvel? You guessed it, Shiki himself. Rebecca couldn't help but panic, rushing towards Shiki in a heartbeat. Amidst the chaos, Shiki and his innocence marveled at the sight of Happy and even dared to ask if the cat was edible. Of course, Happy promptly rejected the outrageous request with a swift and resolute no. After a moment of contemplation, Shiki turned to Rebecca and Happy and made a heartfelt plea. Let's be friends. I've never met another human before. The proposition sent both Rebecca and Happy into a frenzy, causing them to sprint off to the nearby park. Not one to be left behind, Shiki followed suit, chasing after them with gusto. Once in the park, Shiki eagerly introduced his newfound human and robot pals to all the machines around them, proclaiming them as his cherished friends. Rebecca and Happy, caught up in the whirlwind of it all, introduced themselves to Shiki, before joining the machine-led celebration of their first customer with a jubilant party. Little did they know, a hunting robot observed their every move, skulking its way back to Granville's castle to report the arrival of their unexpected guests to the enigmatic Castellan. Inside the cozy inn, Shiki eagerly shared with Rebecca the reason behind his relentless tinkering with the cat boat that they had been acting peculiarly lately. As Rebecca listened intently, Shiki revealed that he originally longed to explore the vast world beyond, but he ended up staying to fix the machines instead. Exhaustion finally caught up with Shiki, and he dozed off into a deep slumber. While Shiki peacefully slept, Rebecca, ever the curious soul, couldn't help but entertain a mischievous thought. What if she could trim Shiki's unruly locks? Just as she was contemplating the daring haircut, Michael, the ever-watchful Demon King, interjected with a tail. He recounted how he had brought Shiki to the garden ten years ago and considered him his dear grandson. It was the machines who had lovingly cared for Shiki all this time. As the night wore on, the hospital robot offered them rooms for a well-deserved rest. However, silence fell upon both Rebecca and Shiki as they surveyed the less-than-ideal condition of the offered accommodations. Morning arrived and Shiki awoke to a startling discovery, his hair had been mysteriously trimmed. In a panic, he dashed around, desperately searching for Michael, only to be met with a distressing cry from Rebecca. Hurriedly, Shiki rushed to her side, finding her in happy bound and gag. Rebecca pleaded for Shiki to set them free, but the nefarious Castellan remained unmoved by her plea. In brave defense of his newfound friends, Shiki declared that they were innocent and posed no harm. But the cold-hearted Castellan brushed off his words, revealing a sinister plan. It seemed they had been waiting for an opportunity like this for someone to arrive by boat after a century had passed. Their intention? To kill Shiki and Rebecca, seizing their ships to make their escape from Granbell. Castellan refused to grant Shiki's request, determined to carry out his deadly scheme. When the gravity of the situation sank in, Castellan explained to Shiki that they had been abandoned by humans for a century, fueling their burning desire to escape Granbell. The only reason they had spared Shiki's life thus far was out of deference to the Demon King. The shocking revelation left Shiki utterly stunned, and without a moment's hesitation, 
The machines pounced on him, delivering blow after blow until he collapsed, helpless and defeated. Rebecca couldn't hold back her tears as she gazed at the battered and bruised Shiki. How could the machines, who Shiki had considered his friends, do such a cruel thing? Anger surged within him, and he felt an overwhelming urge to fight back and give those machines a taste of their own medicine. But amidst the pain and fury, Shiki recalled his grandfather's wise words. If he found a friend who would shed tears for him, he should cherish them forever. With newfound determination, Shiki's fighting spirit ignited. Happy, being the nimble cat he was, managed to free Rebecca from her binds. She revealed to Shiki the secret of his extraordinary power of the Aether Gear, an ancient force that allowed him to manipulate and reshape the Aether within his body. With a single mighty blow, Shiki defeated Castellan, causing a massive landslide that shook the very foundation of the kingdom. Let's make attack! Without wasting a moment, he rushed to rescue Rebecca and Happy. And in a stunning display of his Ether Gear's abilities, Shiki defied gravity, soaring through the air and carrying them to safety on his ship, the Aqua Wing. Zooming away from Grand Bell, Shiki spilled his guts, saying he wanted to stay put and protect his new buddies. But Rebecca, determined to keep her new buddy by her side, grabbed hold of him and insisted they hightail it out of there. Once they were a safe distance away, Rebecca dropped a cosmic bombshell. Grand Bell inked just some tiny kingdom It's part of the humongous Sakura Cosmos. And get this. The Aqua Wing, their ship, is a full-on space-traveling spaceship. Cue the mind-blowing moment. Shiki suddenly realized they were soaring through freaking space. Stars, comets, and all that interstellar jazz surrounded them. But wait for it, that comet they spotted? Nope, it ain't a comet at all. It's a full-fledged dragon, kicking it in the kingdom of Granbell. Talk about a plot twist. Turns out, Castellan and those tricky machines were playing pretend this whole time. Years ago, those machines saw the writing on the wall. Their batteries were running on empty, so they knew their gaze were numbered. That's why Shiki's grandpa, the Demon King, sent him away, promising to shake things up in the universe. As the machines started powering down, Michael chimed in with some deep thoughts. If someone's felt the kind of loneliness they have, maybe a heart ain't all it's cracked up to be. As they bid farewell to Grand Bell, Shiki couldn't help but shed a tear for the grass and trees that had been his silent pals all along. He thanked him from the bottom of his heart, swearing he'd never forget him. With determination in his eyes, Shiki, Rebecca, and Happy set off on their cosmic journey, with Shiki setting a crazy goal for himself, making a hundred friends across the vast universe. Meanwhile, that dragon lady kept on soaring through space, pondering whether Shiki would turn out to be a legendary hero or a wild demon king, bringing both salvation and chaos wherever he went. Oh, the suspense. On board the Aqua Wing, Rebecca excitedly introduced Shiki to B-Cube, a super cool video sharing website. It's a place where folks use this tiny Q thingy to post videos and become B-Cubers. And get this, people who rack up tons of views can actually make moolah from it. Rebecca and Happy already had their own channel and had big plans to earn some serious cash. But hold on to your hats because Rebecca had even grander plans in mind. She spilled the beans that they were headed for the Blue Garden, a legendary place where Shiki could sign up as an adventurer and explore all sorts of stars. Shiki was all about it, thrilled to bits by Rebecca's adventurous scheme. And then, out of the blue, Rebecca asked Shiki and Happy to be her bodyguards for a while. That's when they made their way to the Adventure Guild Shooting Starlight. Once inside the Shooting Starlight building, Shiki's excitement got the better of him. He wanted to reach out and touch every single person there, but Rebecca held him back, not wanting any chaos to ensue. As Rebecca explained the ropes to Shiki, he couldn't resist bugging this super muscular dude, asking him to be friends. Both Shiki and his knack for stirring things up. But just as Rebecca was about to whisk Shiki away again, something caught his eye, an enormous hologram of a woman. Rebecca explained that she was rumored to be a mother figure, bigger than any star known to humanity. Legend had it that ages ago, an adventurer had stumbled upon her in the vast reaches of space, and ever since, people worshipped her as a cosmic goddess. That's why the Shooting Starlight Guild adorned their halls with her majestic image. Shiki had a hunch she'd crossed paths with her before, causing a brief moment of silence in the guild. But it didn't take long for everyone to burst into laughter, thinking Shiki was just joking around as usual. Ignoring their chuckles, Shiki boldly asked if they wanted to be friends with him. Well, that sent the guilt into even more fits of laughter. A slightly embarrassed Rebecca swiftly pulled Shiki out of the building. Outside, Rebecca offered Shiki a reality check. She warned him that most people out there don't really care about each other. Intrigued, Shiki couldn't help but ask why Rebecca wore glasses. 
She confidently explained it was because she was a famous B-cuber, you know, true celeb. But then Happy chimed in, revealing that their channel didn't have a ton of viewers. And just when they thought things couldn't get any worse, a gang of thugs snatched poor Happy and trapped him in a glass jar. These goons claimed Happy was from a planet called Exceed, and they could make a pretty penny by selling him off. Filled with righteous fury, Shiki unleashed his ether gear and dashed off in hot pursuit of those dastardly thugs. While all this was happening, Rebecca's mind drifted back to the time she first met Happy, feeling alone and abandoned just like him. As Shiki chased the dastardly kidnapper through the bustling crowd, he couldn't help but shout to alert everyone that the thug was a no-good rotten scoundrel. With the power of devilish gravity, Shiki sent the villain crashing to the ground. The jar containing Happy bounced around, causing the terrified thug to wildly fire his gun into the air. Amidst the chaos, Shiki wasted no time in demanding the safe return of Happy, but the thug, thinking he had the upper hand, smugly claimed it was impossible for Shiki to retreat his feline friend. Just then, the boss of the thugs, a character named Mipa, appeared on the scene, curious about all the commotion. The thug proudly declared that he had captured Happy for a quick sale. But lo and behold, that's when Rebecca herself made her grand entrance. The gang recognized her as being a B-cuber, although they hilariously messed up her channel's tagline, much to Rebecca's annoyance. With a fiery determination, Rebecca expressed her anger at their heinous plan to kidnap Happy. She warned them that if they dared to harm a single hair on Happy's head, she would never forgive them. Memories of their shared childhood, where they relied on each other because they had no one else, flooded Rebecca's mind. She vowed to be there for Happy always, come what may. When Shiki unleashed his mighty ether gear, he pummeled the thugs with all his might. Meanwhile, their boss whipped out a menacing minigun and started firing at both Shiki and Rebecca. One stray shot accidentally struck the jar containing Happy, causing it to shatter into pieces. The jar had met its breaking point. The scene suddenly shifts to a poignant flashback. It is revealed that Happy and his cat form had been tragically struck by a truck right in front of Rebecca. A sight of her beloved companion injured brought tears streaming down Rebecca's face as she desperately pleaded for someone to save him. In that moment of desperation, Rebecca vowed to never let Happy go again. And just like magic, Happy underwent a remarkable transformation. He turned into a pair of badass pistols known as the Happy Blasters. With the powerful weapons in hand, Rebecca went on an epic rampage, unleashing a hail of bullets against the gang of thugs. I'm gonna make them pay for kidnapping you. Rebecca, with deadly accuracy, took down each and every member of the thug gang. Meanwhile, Shiki lent a helping hand, using his gravity powers to levitate the thugs in midair. It gave Rebecca better aim, ensuring her shots hit their mark. Together, they made quite the dynamic duo. With a final flourish, Rebecca and Happy finished off the thug boss using the Happy Blasters, and thanks to the other bullets they fired, the thugs would meet their demise. Phew. But here's the kicker. Shiki, in all his innocent glory, had no idea that Happy had transformed into a machine. He exclaimed his surprise, unaware of Happy's newfound robotic nature. Rebecca took a moment to explain that after the truck accident, Happy had been rebuilt into a robotic form. It was a revelation that made Shiki reflect on his own words that being friends went beyond just being human or machine. A warm smile spread across his face, embracing the bond they shared. With their epic battle behind them, the three of them returned triumphantly to the Shooting Starlight Guild. In a distant part of space, a cunning pirate relays to his boss that someone in the Blue Garden has spotted the Demon King's grandson leaving Granbell. Their boss, the formidable armored space pirate Elsie Crimson, declares that the time has come and commands her crew to set course for the Blue Garden. While at the Shooting Starlight Guild, Shiki, Happy, and Rebecca make their way to the reception desk to enlist Shiki as an adventurer. They are greeted by the emotional Clarice, the guild's receptionist. Overjoyed by their safe return, Happy and Rebecca embrace Clarice, who can't help but shed tears of relief. Rebecca introduces Shiki to Clarice, requesting to register him as an adventurer, even though identification documents aren't typically required. However, some of the other guild members sneer at Shiki's return, doubting that he has truly met his mother as he claims. Suddenly, a girl named Labelia Christie makes her entrance, mocking Rebecca as an unpopular B-cuber. Labelia pretends to be a fan, though her words carry a hint of mockery. She taunts Rebecca, suggesting that she retire after her recent video failed to impress. Rebecca introduces Labelia to Shiki as a famous B-cuber, but Labelia corrects her, emphasizing that she is, in fact, a very famous B-cuber known by all in the Sakura Cosmos. However, Shiki nonchalantly states that he's never heard of her, much to Labelia's annoyance. 
She snidely advises Rebecca to keep posting her supposedly dull videos to make herself look better. Driven by irritation, Shiki seizes Labelia's wrist and activates his ether gear, causing her to float in midair. The unexpected display astonishes the guild members, but even so, Labelia's fans rush to her defense, praising her beauty and acrobatic skills, even while suspended upside down. Rebecca swiftly intervenes, dragging Shiki away and leaving Labelia grounded. Nevertheless, Labelia finds herself strangely drawn to Shiki, sensing the potential for creating compelling content with him in the picture. At Nikora's restaurant, Shiki, Rebecca, and Happy enjoyed a meal together. Shiki expressed his belief that a guild was like one big family. However, Rebecca chimed in, explaining that it's more of a place where people find job opportunities rather than a tight-knit family. Just as they were conversing, Shiki's online registration as an adventurer was completed, and Rebecca proudly handed him his brand new adventure license. Since they didn't know Shiki's last name, Rebecca registered him as Shiki Granbell. As Shiki glanced at his card, he noticed the E-Class rank, prompting Rebecca and Happy to explain that it was the lowest rank an adventurer could have. Their attention was then caught by people watching the latest video from Labilia. Reluctantly, Rebecca admitted that the video was actually quite good. Inspired, Shiki shared his idea on how they could surpass Labilia's videos by being the first ones to meet the mother. But there was a catch. The mother resided outside the Sakura Cosmos, which meant they needed a better ship and more crew members to assist them. Rebecca swiftly suggested enlisting the help of Professor Weiss, the very same person who had transformed Happy into a robot. With his knowledge and skills, they believed he could be a valuable asset to their mission. Back at the guild, in swoops, Elsie Crimson and her crew are on the hunt for Shiki. One guild member spills the beans that Shiki set off for Planet Norma. And just as one of Elsie's crew members reminds her that Norma is a total ghost town, Elsie's like, duh, I knew that already. In the meantime, on the Aqua Wing, Rebecca drops the bomb so that Shiki can crash in the guest room because she refuses to share a room with him. Happy spills the beans that their ship can fly on autopilot. Curiosity peaked, Shiki asks if he can take the wheel. Rebecca and Happy are totally game, thinking it'll make for a viral video with Shiki's first time flying skills. They whip out the camera and start filming as Shiki takes control. As they zip closer to Norma, Shiki's all like, I want to land this baby. Rebecca and Happy are like, sure thing, buddy. Here's how you do it. But then in a classic Shiki move, he presses a bunch of buttons all at once, sending them on a crazy descent through the atmosphere, narrowly avoiding crystal pillars raining from the sky. They end up crash landing after colliding with one of those sparkly crystals. Rebecca's mad at first, but then she's all smiles when she realizes they caught the whole thing on tape. Talk about a YouTube goldmine. Oh, and Happy's scratching his head, wondering what to do with the ship. Using his epic ether gear, Shiki lightens the ship's load and lifts it back up like it's no biggie. But wait, suddenly an alarm blares, warning them of an upcoming storm of ether earth crystals. Shiki shook, and Happy stepped up to explain that ether is like the magical juice that powers the universe. It's the source of all things cosmic and the essence of pure magic. And get this. Shiki's ether gear lets him mess with the flow of ether in his own body, like a handy-dandy machine mode. Now, Shiki's got questions. He wants to know how folks survive on a planet like Norma. Rebecca spills the beans that they've built an underground city to call home. And let me tell you, when they reach Professor Wace's place, Rebecca and Happy holler for him. Meanwhile, Shiki stumbles upon a pair of nerdy glasses, and lo and behold, they give him X-ray vision. He's goofing around with them when out of nowhere, a trigger-happy dude pops up and tells them not to budge. Rebecca and Happy get all jittery, explaining they're just looking for Professor Weiss Stanner, the genius who fixed Happy up. But guess what? The dude reveals that he is Weiss Stanner. In a far-flung future, two daring explorers stumble upon a chilling sight. Two human corpses, a man and a woman. Their attention is then drawn to a B-cube necklace, which bears the intriguing inscription Eden Zero on its back. Just when things couldn't get any stranger, a mysterious girl named Shiomi appears and introduces herself as the narrator of the story. She urges the audience not to dwell too much on the time jump from the last chapter because, hey, time isn't really a big deal in this tale. Back at the garage, Rebecca wastes no time in explaining to the young man who goes by the name of Weiss that they come searching for Professor Weiss. Despite her explanation, the man remains suspicious, accusing them of working for someone called Cyber. Suddenly, Shiki senses the presence of someone on the floor above them. In the blink of an eye, shots ring out, narrowly missing our group. Ever the agile one, Shiki leaps up to the ceiling and uses his trusty glasses to track down the attacker. With precision, he strikes back and swiftly takes down the would-be assailant. As the shock of the situation settles in, Weiss hops onto a motorcycle and makes a daring escape, convinced that our crew is truly Weiss's friend. 
Before the defeated attacker can fade away, he delivers a foreboding message of impending doom, warning that those who have betrayed will meet their demise at the hands of the mighty Cyber. Instead of cowering in fear, Shiki oddly finds solace in such a message. Well, the plot thickens. Shelving down a riverside restaurant, Rebecca tries to wrap her head around the bizarre situation at hand. Why does this young man share the same name as Professor Weiss? In the meantime, Happy and Shiki throw out their wild speculations, suggesting that perhaps he invented some kind of age-reversing potion that wiped his memory clean. Just when they're pondering the possibilities, Rebecca notices something strange. She can't connect to the internet. And then BAM! A news report pops up announcing the birth of a brand new adventurer's guild called Blue Garden, known as Shooting Starlight, the catch. It's supposed to have been established 50 years ago. Talk about a time warp. Rebecca's memory drifts back to a time when she and Happy visited Weiss and pleaded to stay with him. However, he turned them down, citing the planet's impending demise. As Rebecca steps out of the restaurant, she's struck by the ancient technology surrounding her. The realization hits her like a ton of bricks. They've somehow been transported back 50 years into the past. In X-442 lingo, it means that the guys they encountered were none other than Professor Weiss from half a century ago. As the trio attempts to piece everything together, a colossal robot piloted by the notorious Cyber enters the scene. Mistaking all three of them for Weiss's comrades, Cyber is dead set on making them pay for Weiss's alleged thievery. Oh boy, things just keep getting wilder by the minute. In another corner of town, Weiss clutches a mysterious briefcase, vowing to never let Cyber get his hands on it. Cyber, having tracked down our group in the bustling city, demands that they spill the beans on Weiss's whereabouts, accusing him of stealing his hard-earned moolah. Nervously, Rebecca stammers that they have no idea where he is. As Cyber starts bickering with his cronies, contemplating an attack, Rebecca suggests that they make a hasty retreat to avoid messing with the past. But before they can make their getaway, one of Cyber's lackeys spots them and unleashes a ferocious beatdown on our trio. Never fear, though, because Shiki taps into his demonic gravity powers and sends them soaring through the air like ragdolls. Cyber and his gang are left in awe of Shiki's incredible power, but they retaliate by firing missiles at Shiki's makeshift flying crew. Just as Cyber is about to give chase, Shiki unleashes a gravity-infused punch, leaving Cyber fuming while our heroes seize the chance to escape. Cyber snarls, vowing that they'll be back for more. Taking refuge in a nearby bar, Shiki marvels at the sight of all the diverse and quirky aliens present. Rebecca goes on to explain that these extraterrestrial beings coexist with humans, adopting their languages and cultures. She shares that she knew about the bar because the professor had mentioned it as a hideout. And what a coincidence is when Wee suddenly shows up, catching everyone off guard. In the midst of the chaos, Rebecca hurriedly spills the beans to Wee, trying to explain the peculiar state of affairs they find themselves in. Though initially skeptical, Weiss at least acknowledges that Rebecca and her partner aren't part of Sebra's gang. All eyes turn to an item that Weiss is accused of stealing, which Shiki manages to snatch from his grasp. But just as Shiki takes hold of it, his gravitational powers flicker, causing him to drop the box. To their astonishment, the item opens up, revealing a sassy little android named Iampino. Shiki, along with the others, is taken aback by the presence of this pint-sized robot. Pino introduces herself as an anti-machine android, but before they can fully process this new development, the power suddenly goes out and even Happy shuts down. Rebecca explains that the power outage was due to Pino's electromagnetic pulse ability, which can temporarily disable electronic devices. Ah, no wonder Shiki's other gear went haywire. Thankfully, the power quickly comes back on, leaving Happy completely oblivious to the whole ordeal. Impressed by Pino's powers, Shiki wastes no time and eagerly asks if they can be friends. Although caught off guard by the strange situation, Pino agrees, surprising Rebecca. On the other hand, Waze remains disappointed, still upset about not finding any money in the city. He wonders if Pino can be sold for a profit, but Pino explains that she belongs to her creator and doesn't have a price in the market. She also reveals that she woke up because she thought she heard her master's voice. When Waze asks if Cyber is her master, Pino panics and flees in fear. Waze ponders whether Cyber plans to exploit Pino to steal money and decides that he wants to keep her. He chases after the little android, triggering a memory for Rebecca of a time when she was with the older Weiss, telling him never to steal. The recollection leaves her feeling disappointed in Weiss's past actions. As they mention Sibber, Weiss provides some insights into the group explaining that he and Sibber were once colleagues but have recently become adversaries. 
Outside, Rebecca decides that they need to check on their ship and make sure everything is in order before heading back to Blue Garden. After all, they don't want to mess with Shiki's past any further. It's then that Rebecca notices a peculiar cue inside the suitcase. She's furious because it seems like she unknowingly took it, but suddenly the device activates. The BQ reveals a distressing recording of Cyber instructing Pino to dance for him. When Pino can't comply, Cyber heartlessly removes her left leg, reducing her to tears, and then commands her to erase all memories of her previous master. As the trio watches in horror, Cyber orders one of his henchmen to forcibly erase Pino's memories and replace her legs with nails. Shiki swears to bring Pino back to her rightful master, vowing that nothing will make his friend cry. Rebecca, equally determined, refuses to forgive the despicable man. Meanwhile, observant Happy notices something significant on the Pino box. It indicates the date of her last treatment, X-492, which is her year of origin. It means that Cyber has truly messed with the past. With unwavering resolve, the trio pledges to stop Cyber and save Pino, no matter what it takes. In their hiding place, Pino greets her master, Cyber, with utmost loyalty. Cyber declares that they will claim the entire city for themselves. From the shadows, Whis observes his former friend's actions, and his expression turns serious when he sees the Foot Brothers working under Sibir. Having discovered the whereabouts of Bernadette, Rebecca, Happy, and Shiki, the Foot Brothers head there on their motorcycles. Rebecca shares her plan with Happy to let Shiki face them and trust in his strength as their friend. With determination, Shiki declares that they will rescue Pino. Whis, on the other hand, intends to reprimand Pino for running away. However, the little android tries to explain that she was actually stolen. Fueled by anger, Whis threatens to tear off Pino's remaining leg. Just as Cyber is about to carry out his cruel act, Whis throws a stone at him, causing him to drop Pino. Swiftly, Whis claims ownership of Pino, asserting that she would be wasted under Cyber's control. Rebecca, Happy, and Shiki arrive on their motorcycle, but their path is blocked by a wall. In a fit of rage, Shiki demands that Pino be returned, unleashing a powerful gravity wave that pulls the gang members towards him. He then launches a relentless gravity fist frenzy attack. Rebecca praises Shiki for his prowess while Whis takes Happy on their motorcycle and leaves with Pino. Both Rebecca and Shiki are left distraught as Cyber drops a metal casket onto Shiki. Meanwhile, Cyber sets his sights on pursuing Weiss. Before leaving, he orders the Foot Brothers to apprehend Rebecca. Desperate, Rebecca tries to contact Shiki. But the Foot Brothers introduce themselves as Sibra's companions, causing further distress. Hey bro, what should we do? We're the infamous Southern Annihilators! Shiki! I'm surrounded by some weirdos! Mm. On the streets, Sibra chases Waze's group using his mag gear. Pino, torn between her loyalty to Sibra and her growing connection with Waze, expresses her need to fulfill her duties for Sibra. Happy tries to encourage her to run away, but Whis refuses, proclaiming that this Pino is his bot and he won't abandon her. The stage is set for an intense clash as alliances are tested and friendships are pushed to their limits. Back at the hideout, Shiki finds himself in a room filled with trash after falling from the ceiling. Startled by a fly, he cautiously backs away until he comes across a deactivated and damaged robot body. At first glance, Shiki believes it to be his friend Michael from 50 years ago, and tears well up in his eyes. However, to his surprise, the robot suddenly powers up and introduces itself as Johnny. Johnny reassures Shiki that it's only natural for him to mistake him for another robot. He explains that he is a mass-produced model of robots like himself. Inspired by his previous experiences fixing robots in Grand Bell, Shiki attempts to repair Johnny. Amidst their interaction, Johnny reveals that he was originally created for Seber and subsequently discarded. He expresses his gratitude for meeting such a kind-hearted human like Shiki before finally falling silent. Inside the hideout, Rebecca expertly dodges the relentless attacks of the Foot Brothers. Those guys seem really fixated on her feet, asking for permission to touch them. You, major foot fetish alert. Hold on a second! Your legs are fabulous. Such beauty. Eat lunch, you lousy person! But wait, here comes Shiki, jumping down from above like a gravity-defying ninja. He unleashes a spectacular magimek attack that sends the Foot Brothers flying. Talk about a flashy entrance. Rebecca points Shiki in the right direction and off Whis and Pino go on their mission. Meanwhile, Cyber has Whis's group trapped with his fancy night gear. He's feeling pretty confident, calling Whis a gunner. Rude much? But then, out of nowhere, Shiki swoops and yanks Cyber out of his mech and gives him a good smack to the face. Ouch. Cyber realizes he's messed with the wrong guy. Shiki, 
Let Sibber know that machines have feelings too, and he's not gonna let them be mistreated. It's time to fight back. Shiki goes all out with another mind-blowing Magimek attack showing Cyber who's boss. The bad guys don't stand a chance. The machines have tears! Stop like that! Magimek attack! <laughs> Just when it looks like victory is in sight, Pino activates her EMP, freezing everything in its tracks. Boom, no more funny business. Pino makes it clear that she won't be anyone's toy. You go, Pino. Weiss tries to take advantage of the situation and aim his weapon at Cyber, but the EMP messes with his plans. Oh well, at least Weiss manages to destroy Cyber's robotic arm, giving him a taste of his own medicine. Revenge is sweet. Rebecca rushes over and embraces Happy tightly as he comes back online. Shiki, concerned about Pino, asks if she's alright. Pino, curious, wonders why Shiki worried about the engine and her himself. Shiki explains that it's because they're friends, which causes Pino to burst into tears. Aw, friendship can be so touching. Meanwhile, in space, a crew member informs their leader that a Skull Fairy is on its way to the planet Norma. In a hidden alley, Rebecca spills the beans about Cyber swiping the city's military robot using Pino's unique powers, but don't worry, the robot has been turned over to the police. Happy, always curious, asks how Pino ended up in the past when she's from their time. Pino sadly reveals that her memory is wiped clean thanks to a little treatment she received from Professor Wace. They figure if they can go back to the future, Pino's memories might come flooding back. Just as they're discussing their plan, the police show up. Rebecca remains unfazed, but Pino points out that they'll get in trouble without proper identification. Oh, time to make a speedy getaway. Wace joins in on the fun when the police recognize him as part of Sepper's gang. Run, everyone run. Back at Aqua Wing, Shiki, Happy, Rebecca, and Pino prepare to set off for the Blue Garden to find their way back in time. But just as they take off, the pesky police start chasing them and shooting at their ship. Luckily, Aqua Wing is fast and can outrun them. Phew. However, their escape is halted by an unexpected energy field that prevents them from leaving the planet. What a cosmic inconvenience. But wait, was that sneaking into the ship? It's waste. He offers a deal to the group. If they hand over control of Aqua Wing to him, he can help them navigate through space. Rebecca worries about getting arrested, but Weiss reassures her that she'll be fine because she has proper identification. Shiki agrees to let Weiss take the helm, much to Rebecca's annoyance. But Shiki has a point. If they want to find their mother, they'll meet a better ship. Weiss then reveals his incredible ether gear called Machina, which he uses to transform Aqua Wing from the inside out, evading the police effortlessly. Just sit back and relax. Let's do this. He even uses his powers to repair Pino's legs. Talk about handy. With her ship now free from the energy field, they venture into space. Suddenly, Rebecca's phone rings and the caller is none other than Professor Weiss. Talk about a surprise twist. The professor shares some shocking news. Norma has been trapped in the past for 50 years due to a monstrous creature called the Chronophage. It seems the planet's time-consuming nature has permanently stuck it in the past. The professor reveals that he and many other inhabitants have managed to escape Norma before it got stuck. He also drops a bombshell. He's only fixed Pino, and her true master is the Demon King. Well, that certainly catches Shiki off guard. The professor then shifts his attention to the younger Weiss, who has fallen victim to the Chronophage's time-eating antics. It seems the possibility of a time paradox is off the table. But just as he's about to reveal more, the signal cuts off. What a cliffhanger. Aboard Aqua Wing, the pirate ship Elsie Crimson intercepts them, using a tractor beam to tow their ship. Happy and Weiss start freaking out, while Rebecca recognizes the flag of Elsie Crimson and realizes they're in big trouble. Elsie herself appears as a hologram, introducing herself and her fearsome pirate crew. She mocks them for being captured by her tractor beam and reveals her plan to sell them as slaves on the planet Gilst. Weiss tries to negotiate by offering himself as their mechanic, but Shiki has a different idea. Shiki boldly declares that he will plunder Elsie's skull fairies instead. His friends are taken aback by his audacity. Elsie gives him a clue about where to find her and ends the communication. Determined to escape, Shiki explores the ship and encounters a swarm of disgusting alien growth. To his surprise, the space pirate's arms transform into tentacles and attack him. Though initially knocked down, Shiki quickly gets back on his feet and effortlessly defeats some of the pirates. On the other side, Rebecca, Happy, and Pino have been captured by the tentacles of a creature called Parasite Copicate Season 4. 
Waste springs into action and Happy transforms into blasters to assist Rebecca in destroying the tentacles and freeing themselves. It's a wild and intense fight for survival against these slimy adversaries. On the other hand, Shiki bursts into Elsie's room ready to throw down, but wait for it. Elsie turns around and BM. She's got a freaky skull face. They start duking it out, trading blows left and right. It's an epic showdown, and after an intense struggle, Shiki emerges as the victor. But hold up, turns out that Elsie was just a slimy alien parasite imitating her appearance. The real Elsie pops up and congratulates Shiki, rewarding him with a ship from a dude named Ziggy. But guess what? The party doesn't stop there. They find themselves smack in the middle of a battle with the Interstellar Union Army. Don't worry, Elsie's got their backs, protecting the gang from the army's attacks. Weiss, the tech whiz, activates the ship's wave drives, teleporting them near the Blue Garden. Talk about a quick getaway. With a breather, the gang starts exploring their cool new ship. They stumble upon a magical bathtub that gives Rebecca some super-duper powers, like her very own ether gear. Splashy splash, Rebecca's got some serious mojo now. But hold your horses, folks. In Ziggy's room, Shiki accidentally activates a sassy android named Witch Regret. Bam! The ship transforms into the mighty battleship Eden Zero. Purified. What's going on? The spacecraft. Eden's Zero. Witch Regret spills the beans about gathering the four brilliant stars of the Demon King, her android crew, to navigate through the treacherous Dragonfall, where dragons roam free. Dragons, dude. How cool is that? Thank goodness! Blue Garden is still in the present! We bid farewell to Whis and the gang hits up Shooting Starlight to get the lowdown on Sister Ivory, one of the missing androids. But wait, there's trouble. Shiki and Pino save Labilia from a kidnapping, courtesy of Jin, a wind-wielding mercenary with some serious ether gear skills. They have an epic face-off, but before things get too spicy, Jin gets a call to retreat. He challenges Shiki to a rematch in Gilst. Oh snap, the rivalry intensifies. Back in Gilst, Shiki and Pino discover that Rebecca and other B-Cubers have been kidnapped, likely by that sneaky Jin. They're not gonna let that slide, so the gang gears up to take on Gilst and rescue their friends. But hold up, someone's been eavesdropping on their plan. It's a girl who knows about Eden Zero. She's got some info, but she's keeping it close to the vest. In the meantime, Jen is approached by Sister and her sidekick, Ganoff. They're not here for a friendly chat, um no. They challenge Jin to a full-on showdown. It's gonna be an epic battle, three against one. But wait, there's more. Homer stumbles upon another android named Sister, who's being held captive by Rogue Out. She convinces Ways to set her free, and boy, does she have a story to tell. Turns out, the leader of Rogue Out is a total fraud, keeping Sister locked up for years to exploit her healing powers. That's just messed up. But fear not, Sister revives the victims and lends a helping hand to Elega before joining Shiki's crew to escape from the clutches of the Chronophage. Jin, please. <laughs> what are you doing? Ah! Take that, bad guys. Meanwhile, Rebecca ain't sitting around doing nothing. She takes charge and conquers Illiga to save a stranded B Cuber. With the victims back on their feet, Rebecca makes sure they're safely evacuated while waiting for Shiki to arrive. And boy, does he arrive in style. Using his gravity powers, he drops in with his crew straight onto Eden Zero, escaping from the clutches of the approaching Chronophage. Phew, talk about a close call. After narrowly escaping the clutches of the Chronophage, Gilst undergoes some serious changes. The planet's population gets decimated, and its natural beauty starts to be restored. But guess who managed to escape? It's none other than Drak and Joe, one of the notorious Oration Seas Galactica, a group of intergalactic criminals. This guy is bad news. In the scene back on Eden Zero, Hamura reveals herself to be a disciple of Valkyrie Yuna, one of the missing brilliant stars. She's officially welcomed into the crew, along with Weiss and the reprogram Moscow, who turns out to be part of the ship's original crew. Talk about a reunion. Following Sister's intuition, the gang heads to the Iron Hill Monument near Blue Garden, where they hope to find another brilliant star, Hermit. Turns out, Hermit is in a catatonic state due to some serious psychological trauma. Poor thing. But fear not, which is on the case. She determines that Hermit's mind is trapped within the digital realm of a game called Rogue Fantasia. Without hesitation, Shiki and the gang decide to dive into the game by uploading their consciousness into digital avatars. It's like stepping into a virtual world, 
but they're warned that any injuries or deaths they experience there will affect their physical bodies. Yikes. Wow! Camera, why'd you go out of your way to pick a male character? It is I, Pino. What right? the hell? Wait a second, who are you? What do you mean? It's me, why? Is... I mean... After our brave crew interrogates an NPC to gather information about Hermit's location, they soon come face to face with Jamilov, a player aligned with the notorious Draken Joe. This guy is infamous for his merciless actions, killing NPC and other players without getting caught. But hold on, there's a twist. Jamilov reveals himself to be Amira, a shape-shifting government agent investigating Draken Joe. He tried to eliminate the original Homura, but failed. Now, Amira joins forces with Shiki and the gang to take down Jamilov, who's been using cheats to gain an unfair advantage. Talk about a double agent. With Hermit's reluctant help, they confront Jamilov and his cheating ways. Frustrated by his impending defeat, Jamilov tries to wipe out the entire game world using a computer code. But something unexpected happens. Hermit, who used to be indifferent towards the NPC, starts to question her own actions as Shiki proclaims that they are living beings too. In an intense battle, Shiki manages to defeat Jamilov, ending his reign of cheating. The city is returning to normal. We've been saved. Hermit agrees to quit the game, but she continues to isolate herself. However, their troubles aren't over yet. Back on Eden Zero, Spider Jamilov's real-world persona hacks into the ship's computer system, taking complete control. It's like dealing with a pesky hacker who won't give up. Our crew needs to find a way to regain control of their beloved ship and stop Spider's mischief. Fifteen years ago, Hermit, in her search for companionship, approached Dr. Mueller and his research partner, hoping to establish a bond. Little did she know what awaited her. The team was working on a machine to provide energy to the dying robot planet, Hook. But when the machine was activated, it caused the obliteration of Hook and all of Hermit's robot comrades stationed there. Shocked and devastated, Hermit couldn't understand how something meant to save them had resulted in such destruction. As the human scientists, including Mueller, celebrated their achievement, it became clear that they saw the disaster as an insult to robots. In a cruel turn of events, Mueller subjected Hermit to torturous experiments for the next two years. The pain and trauma inflicted on her were unimaginable. Eventually, Mueller and his team were apprehended and he was held accountable for his heinous actions. Captain. She finally has her freedom. Back in the present, the awesome crew of Eden Zero stands strong against Spider's destructive antics as he tries to bring down their beloved ship, Eden Zero. But guess what? Hermit realizes that deep down, they still crave human friendship. With a little encouragement from Ziggy, Hermit takes charge and restores the ship's system, giving Spider a taste of his own medicine with a mighty missile strike. Boom, baby. Hermit is back to her cheerful self and rejoins the four shining stars. But there's still one missing member, the elusive Valkyrie. Sister suggests checking out Shooting Starlight for some clues, but there's a sneaky suspicion that the guild master, Noel Glenfield, might be involved. So they set off on a new adventure to Planet Mildian, where fortune tellers dwell. On Planet Mildian, they meet the mystical seer, Shiome, who puts Shiki and his team to the test in an epic battle. Meanwhile, Spider seeks revenge against Shiki's crew, but ends up getting the ultimate punishment from the boss himself, Draken. Talk about a major backfire. Draken contacts No to gather information on the ship, and while all that's happening, Shiki and Homura find themselves in the Sun Jewel Labor District. Trouble brews when they cross paths with Garrett, Madame Kirune's tough henchman. He gives Homura a whipping she won't forget and snatches her away. But Shiki ain't one to back down, so he confronts Garrett head-on to save his friend. Rebecca's group faces another challenge when Labilia offers to help them enter the labor district. <laughs> but it turns out she's just using them for a mean-spirited BQ collaboration. What a double-crosser. Rebecca's left humiliated, but luckily, she finds Solace and Mino, a fellow BQ viewer who offers to guide her to the labor district. With Shiki and Homura in a bind, Garrett takes them on a quest for the powerful and precious Black Rock Stone. 
In a surprising twist, Nino reveals their true identity as the kind-hearted agent Madame Curinay and grants Rebecca's group access to the Labor District. The gang encounters Paul, a BQ-wielding student of Valkyrie, who holds the key to the truth about her current state. However, Paul hesitates to share it with Homura. With Paul's guidance, Rebecca reunites with Shiki and Homura, joining forces to take on the formidable Black Rock. In a flashback, we dive into Valkyrie's past, where she awakens a young orphan named Homura on the planet Oido. Their bond faces opposition from the prejudiced locals who hold biased views against machines. But love conquers all right. Fast forward five years and Homura undergoes training but lands in hot water when he defends Valkyrie against an insult hurled by a local magistrate's son. The judge insists that Homura needs his biological mother, who is none other than the enslaved Kurine. Valkyrie takes matters into her own hands, allowing Kurinai to reunite with Homura by assuming her place. Two years later, Valkyrie discovers that Kurinai has chosen to remain in Sun Jewel's Lagra district, ruling over the planet and showing no intention of returning to Homura. As tensions escalate, Kurinai provokes a horde of monstrous creatures known as Stones to attack the district. Valkyrie valiantly fights alongside the workers, defending them against the relentless horde. In the present time, Homura stumbles upon the remains of her beloved teacher Valkyrie. But alas, Pino confirms that there's no bringing her back. It's a real tearjerker. Thankfully, Shiki is there to give Homura a comforting bear hug and let her have a good cry. What a softy. On the other hand, Shiki is ready to face off against Kirine, the one responsible for Valkyrie's fate. He's determined to bring Kirinai to justice and make him answer for what happened. Go, Shiki, go. But wait, things take a wild turn. Draken, that sneaky hacker dude, hacks into the Blaze satellite, aiming to snatch Eden's zero for himself. That's not cool, dude. And to make matters worse, Kurinai sends his lackeys, Garrett, Nino, and Baku, to wreak havoc in the Lagra district. They're up to no good, I tell ya. Rebecca, our fearless girl, tries to rally Homura to join the workers in battling Kurinai's gang. But Homura, still grieving over Valkyrie, decides to take some time to heal. We totally get it, girl. Take all the time you need. But fear not, because Whis, the genius inventor, steps up in his super cool superhero alter ego arsenal. He's got a modified mechanical suit powered by his other gear, ready to kick some serious butt. You go waste. Show him what you're made of. When Shiki goes head to head with Kurinai in the Lagra district, Rebecca finds herself caught in a tight spot, facing off against Mino. It's a tough battle, but Rebecca is not one to back down. Unfortunately, she's defeated by Mino. But hold on, folks. Just when things seem bleak, Rebecca notices something clues. And suddenly, she realizes her own hidden power, her other gear. It's time to rewind time, baby. With her newfound ability, she turns the tables and conquers Nino with lightning-fast speed. She's unstoppable. Meanwhile, Honora, despite still feeling the effects of Garrett's vicious attack, musters up all her strength and joins her allies in the battle. She's determined to avenge the desecration of Valkyrie's remains. With a fierce display of power, Homura draws Valkyrie's sword and strikes down her enemies. Talk about a powerful moment. Shiki, not one to back down, teams up with Kurine Dragoon to take on the remaining foes. Together, they unleash an unstoppable force, showing their enemies who's boss. <laughs> Victory is within their grasp. With Nino disabling Kirine's robot army, Shiki and Paul decide that Homura should be the one to decide Kirine's fate. Kirine, trying to manipulate Homura, feigns pity and seeks forgiveness. But Homura is no fool. He realizes that his true family is Valkyrie. And he demands that Kirine leave and never return. Talk about standing up for what's right. But Kirine's troubles aren't over yet. He's attacked and captured by one of his own victims who manages to break free. Justice is served. When the Shiki group leaves Valkyrie and Shrine in Sun Jewel, they make their way back to Eden Zero, which has miraculously escaped Draken's hack. Phew, what a relief. The crew finds themselves in a debate between Witch and Sister about remaking Valkyrie from her backup data. Witch warns that it would create a different android without the emotional attachment to the crew. After some reflection, they agree with Shiki's wisdom that they should accept their defeat. In a surprising twist, 
Homura offers herself as a replacement for Valkyrie among the four shining stars. What a selfless act. And so Shiki's journey on Eden Zero continues, with new adventures awaiting him and his crew. The film comes to a close, leaving us excited for what lies ahead. The moral of the story is that in the wildest of sci-fi adventures, it's important to be kind to NPC, respect robot rights, and never mess with a crew that has a talking cat and a gravity-defying hero.